Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of our higher education podcast series which is all about disability and its intersections. Today we'll be talking about the fun and awesome topic of sex and relationships um, and exploring uh, our lived experiences um, and and, uh, addressing a couple of questions to the issues that have come up in recent years. For those that are joining us for the first time I am your host for today Piers Wilkinson Um, And I work for diversity and ability, as you can see from the logos behind me um, in the higher education team as their policy and campaigns lead. I'm also a publicly appointed commissioner um, on the Disabled Students Commission, and I do a lot of policy stuff, the boring stuff. Um, But uh, my much more fun companions today, um, Adam, do you want to introduce yourself first, please? Thank you, Beth. My name is Adam Hyland, my friend Andrew, he, him, and I'm one of the founding directors of DNA. I'm, I'm the director of like, disability and inclusion, and in this year, we're the national David Pitching of the anyway. Awesome. Um, It's always nice to have an ex-officer alongside me as well, uh, as it's uh, always good to see how things have changed over the years. Um, But last but not least, of course, um, Ellie, would you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Piers. Um, I'm Ellie Thompson. I also work at Diversity and Ability alongside Adam and Piers, and I'm our Senior Communications Officer. So I produce and write um, and create a lot of the content that you see across DNA's website and social platforms. Um, I'm also a disabled queer woman, um, and all of those things are absolutely central to my identity and why I love working at DNA so much, uh, and kind of alongside fellow members of my community. So I'm really excited to be talking about um, sex and relationships with you both today. Brilliant. Um, uh, Ellie has always been on the background of this series, so it's very nice to have her on the forefront uh, discussing this great topic that we have today. The the first question um, that we're going to be addressing today um, is to do with desexualization and fetishization. Now, those are two big words, but effectively what they mean is desexualization is the removal of sexual autonomy or sexual identity from an individual or a group of individuals. You can see why we're talking about this in a disability context. Um, and fetishization is the much more commonly known one, but it is the oversexualization or hyper sexualization of an individual through the in, uh, through another person's view or another person's desire or fantasy um, which comes up a lot with disability and it's something that our community often talks about there's been a split in the community over desexuality uh, sorry desexualization and asexuality um, and, and the conflict there of being seen as desexualized but also asexual by by straight away by by by, by default So given that um, this can be quite common for a lot of us to experience, I know I've experienced it personally, I uh, was wondering if either of you had had uh, experiences of either desexualization or fetishization, um, and what do you think the steps are that we have to take um, as a society to to change this cultural understanding of what disability is and uh, disability in sex and relationship education in particular? Um, Adam, I'll come to you first, if that's all right. Yeah, thank you, Ms. I think um, historically this has happened quite a lot, and, and when I kind of put this question, I had to kind of rethink, I guess, back in the last kind of 10, 10 years, if not more. And actually, what, what I'm what, what I realized is that this can happen. Um, but discreetly, but even if it's discreet, it can have a huge impact on disabled people, how uh, disabled people are perceived, and of course, how disabled people feel about themselves and their identity. I think over the years, yeah, I've been asked questions like, how do you have sex? Now, like, for one, you wouldn't ask that to any other 
person in society. So why is it okay to ask someone who may have a physical different physical diversity that seems to be okay? And actually, it's not okay. And regardless of whether you're comfortable talking about sex relationships or not, it's not an okay question. And to make that assumption that it is okay, I think it speaks volumes in terms of how people inside you, the people in terms of sex relationships. Um, from my video, when I was younger, to deal with that, I would often use a swinging monkey from the time of Chico or something, a bit like Jovi, because that was my way of coping with quite a personal question. Um, I'm not suggesting that was necessarily the best response in terms of uh, educating. Um, the idea that it's not okay to ask those questions when you're in that moment and you're being uh, I guess victimized by dealing with that inappropriate question. That was certainly my way of coping with it. Um, and often the person on the other end didn't know what to do with that. And I do it in many ways. But in, in all ways, it's none of their business how I have sex. It's just none of their business. So for me, that is my experience of it. And I guess going back more briefly by my own campaigns, when I was a disability officer, even at um, from the university, I'm um, having. Um, Mirrors in accessible toilets, having condom machines in accessible toilets, having sanitary provision in disabled toilets. Because if you're going to um, uh, non um, non accessible toilets, but one for better uh, wording, you had those facilities. They all, all about them, but there was no accessible bar from on campus that has those facilities. So when I, when I say about discreet uh, discrimination and desexualization, I think those lack of facilities in accessible bathrooms made you come up with home how society did desexualize the same way. You picked up on quite a few experiences there and points that you know, I, I myself have experienced that, you know, that question as a fellow wheelchair user of, you know, how do you have sex and that automatic response to, you know, make a joke out of it. And my my response wasn't to do with the karma sutra. My response was always, oh, thank you for the offer, but you're, you're not my type. Um, and, you know, watching them backpedal always used to be a little bit of pettiness that I enjoyed. Um, but it is, that, it is that point of, you know, there's the, that cultural issue as well as that sort of structural and societal design issue of, oh, it's an accessible toilet. Why do they need a condom machine or uh, sanitary products or a, even sometimes even uh, baby changing facilities? Because obviously disabled people can't have kids, right? Um, and it's that sort of just both social erasure as well as individual, um, you know, stepping in it, as it were. Ellie, I wanted to come over to you next on this and see if, you, if there was anything similar that you experienced or um, thought you might want to add. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that I'd want to touch on um, is just how kind of this intersects with other aspects of identity. Um, it's something we've talked about at length in some of the other videos in the series, um, especially the queerness and disability video um, and the women uh, disabled women video. So make sure you check out both of those. Um, but just the ideas of how different aspects of your identity, especially in terms of sex and relationships, can really conflict. And often as queer people, we're hypersexualized and reduced to just how 
you know, we have sex, who we have sex with, whether we have sex or not, isn't even really a question. Whereas for disability, it's, it's kind of the, the exact opposite of that. So that can lead to a lot of kind of internal conflict in your identity in terms of how you navigate being at the same time hypersexualized and desexualized. Um, and I think for women, there's so many questions of, um, and, and for queer people of, of autonomy. Um, I think this is a really, really great example of that and the examples that you've both given in terms of being asked questions that a non-disabled person would never be asked. Um, I think also for, for women and queer people, there's often experiences of kind of your bodily autonomy being similarly violated. Um, as well as that kind of more psychological side of things. Um, so if you if you visibly pre present with a mobility aid, um, kind of the the attitude that people may have to you and the the level of uh, sexual harassment that that exposes you to. Um, so we've talked about both of those things in much more length um, in other videos. So do make sure you watch those to kind of listen to those experiences. But I just think. Um, it, do, it does create conflict and it does create vulnerability and a lack of psychological safety when you're trying to kind of navigating those aspects of your identity and trying to bring them into harmony when society kind of sees them as quite discordant. I, that's a very, very good point that you raise. And it's something that in the last couple of months on Twitter, that's particularly disability Twitter, has been really raised, uh, particularly on the 3rd of December this month, it was International Day of Disabled People. Um, and one of the core cool things that came out was how, you know, these, these platforms and these spaces and even in-person spaces, the jokes about, oh, well, she can't run away or uh, and that sort of uh, violence against women, even in a joke form, is still violence and still makes people feel unsafe. That's really come to the forefront. So I'm really glad that you picked that up and picked that out. Um, my, my own uh, issue there is often, you know, a lot of queer spaces aren't accessible for us as well. So even when you want to express yourself and, you know, try and change cultural attitude about disabled people not being sexual and not being uh, able to or participate you then come into the barrier of you literally can't get into the space uh, and that, th th those sorts of things. Talking about that sort of misunderstanding of disability, misunderstanding of the, the relationships that we have and that assumption to do with how things work. Um, a little while ago uh, Dr Phil uh, the famous Dr. Phil, as I should say, um, so that people don't get confused with their GP or something, but uh, got into a bit of hot water with the rest of our community um, when he stated that partners can't be carers um, and that you must either be you know, a lover or and a partner or a carer and a, a, a someone that supports you. You can't be both. Given that within the UK there's been that rapidly rising social care charges and also a national shortage of social care workers uh, within within the UK across the board. Many, many of us just can't afford social care via that, you know, structured local authority approach or can't get support because they live in a remote region um, or there's just not enough staff available. Um, Given you know that complexity of issue and what um, the, the reaction to what Dr. Phil said, and in particular that sort of misunderstanding of how disabled people's autonomy works within sex and relationships, I wanted to get your thoughts on this issue and what, what you think we can do to 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 address this sort of misunderstanding. So, Ellie, I'll come to you first on this one, if that's okay. Definitely. Um, it's something that I remember so clearly as a moment kind of within our community and on a personal level. Um, that idea that I can't remember Dr. Phil's exact words, but that 100% of relationships that involve care fail, that 100% is really burned in, burned in my uh, memory. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a kind of some sense of like a nice side to it in terms of is one of the places where when we feel that collective rage where the community comes together to share stories that really prove that wrong and that's something that I really enjoyed being able to be a part of um, is you know seeing um, disabled people in relationships talk about how how successful their relationship was and how it was so much more than than about the experiences of disablement that they might have within that relationship 
Um, I, I mean, in terms of kind of what we can do, I think there's a real um, global need to unpack what we even mean by the term care. I think that's how I've been able to kind of address it in, in myself and my relationships is knowing that um, there is a degree of care that I need that, you know, that I can't access um, through the government that I can't pay for um, that, you know, a partner or a friend um, will provide, but also recognizing the amount of care that I give out in my relationships and realizing that the kind of what we may see as care has so many kind of damaging roots and isn't really a reality of what what how a symbiotic relationship works. Um, I think that's that's kind of what was a turning point for me and still something that I find hard to to kind of work through when you know you're being consistently told you know that you are a burden that your that your impairments make you kind of a challenge I think kind of unlearning the notion that we have that care is about physical tasks we complete for someone and really kind of um, unpacking how care is so much more than that and recognizing the care that you give out in your relationships um, and realizing you know uh, although being disabled is central to my identity it's not all of who I am as a person and you definitely can't reduce my relationships to being kind of just interabled relationships there's so much more than that um, so I think just kind of trying my best to internalize all of those things and also to advocate for them widely you know to think about what we mean when we talk about care and how really there's so much more to it than what Dr. Phil and you know millions of others may have said. Um, I think that was that was what was key for me personally, and and what I'd hope to kind of advocate for more widely as well. I think that's such an important point about you know understanding what care is in the first place, um, and the, all of the forms that it can come in, and also you know challenging the assumption that if a relationship between a disabled person and a non-disabled person breaks down it's because they're okay or not because of the myriad of reasons relationships break down not in due in part to the systemic cost of being disabled putting extra pressure you know nobody's looking at fixing oh why we're being charged an extra 600 pound a month just for being disabled they're looking at oh well they just can't work together so that's i think that's a really good point on on you know reanalyzing what care is and reanalyzing how relationships work um, and I think it's a, something our own community should be doing as well as everyone else as I think there's a lot of uh, bad, badly taught understanding even within our own community. Um, before we move on to the very very final moment of today's uh, thing I want to come to you Adam on, on this topic and ask for any, any insights that you might have. Thank you Adam. I wholeheartedly agree with what Ellie has really articulated. I guess for me, this is very close to home. Um, where I work in digital arts, I've had um, um, a, a father of what was my ex actually say um, to me, um, I think next time you, know, you need to you need to think about dating someone like you because it was seen really really automatically that my hair was the reason that we didn't work. The reality of it is and this one what really resonated with what Ellie says. I know wholeheartedly I did more care in that relationship for many, many, many years. And care is is so broad and wide and what you bring to a relationship is so diverse. Um when I heard those words from me oh my ex I was Outlet, and um, because it couldn't be further from the truth. The one thing I would say though is for me, uh, being in a relationship, you need that symbiotic way of working, and every relationship is different and unique, and everyone's 
hairs in different ways. If we're looking at the physical element of sex, um, I have a pretty good hour to walk. Um, I don't like saying these words because I don't think it should be about luck, but I think I'm lucky because I know how many people need to know that I care and don't get I won't go on my tape box for that one right now. But my point being is, I think for me, it's about independence as well. And um, whilst um, I have a great relationship with my wife, um, and we don't argue that much, we don't, I'm yeah. um, really lucky. I do want, need, that uh, independence, if I want to, and then go on my hands and shut the door, not my words. But I want that independence, so I do that. I think having my own support enables me to have my independence in that relationship. That does not mean that my wife doesn't give me, doesn't support me with shit. Absolutely does. But for me as an individual in that relationship, I think individualism is important in that relationship. I think having my own independence, my own sport is really important. I think also, just finally, just to, um, I think it's important that yeah, disagreeing with your other part. Is important because we all disagree at times. I think it's very difficult to say that I don't agree, I don't agree. Oh, by the way, you need to just assist me in the world. But, yeah, that's a difficult dynamic to have. I don't want to be in the position to be able to disagree and not have to then go, oh, sorry, but can you just support me? Yeah. So, um, I think Dr. Phil is completely wrong. He, but they certainly have quite um, a narrow view on what care and relationships actually are, in my opinion. But I guess I prefer to add that independence and put in there because I think that's really important too. I couldn't, couldn't agree more with you, actually. Um, I think that the this entire conversation today and a lot of the conversations in the last year at the very least um, really do highlight that the the number one issue around sex and relationships for disabled people yes we need to change culture but it is ensuring independence and autonomy for for the individual involved you know making sure that there's not an unfair power dynamic and we work towards fixing a lot of the issues that people put on disabled relationships and interabled relationships as Ellie mentioned you know, reduce the violence against women if they have independence and autonomy away from their partner. Reduce uh, being able to buy your partner a surprise present um, for Christmas as it's coming up around the corner means independence and being able to independently go up. So as a, a very final thing, um, I always like to ask this of all of the, the guests, if you could say one thing to your um, to the audience, um, whether it's a bit of advice or something that you want them to go away and do, um, what would it be? A very short sentence, if possible, please. Go to Ellie first. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short. I think we we often kind of don't set kind of those tasks or those things to do for disabled people in these videos for good reason, because we have enough tasks and responsibilities. Um, but I think kind of in the context of what we've been talking about and how much of this is really deeply internalized for a lot of us. Um, I think if I was to say one thing to go away and do is for disabled people to, to take the time to really tangibly think about the ways that you provide care to those in your community, to those you have relationships with, and just try and use that as a starting point to unlearn the narrative that we've been kind of indoctrinated into, that you are someone to be cared for, not someone who gives care also. That would be my kind of one, easy task big ask but an important one uh, i think uh adam i don't think i can really talk that as, um, beautifully articulated. i think i would say be proud of your identity 
we find you security and get the intuitive questions in and stand up against that good form of, of discrimination and harassment and constantly doing what is got to feel. Thank you. Um, I agree with both of what you said. Um, for me, just finally, um, practically, um, I've had this conversation with other disabled people before. If you're sat there thinking, oh, this is all well and good, but you know, I, I'm interested in it, but I just can't because of my disability. There's communities out there that you can come and talk to, uh, to talk about equipment that works, to talk about positions at work to talk about the fact that sex isn't just to do with genitalia. Sex is a lot more uh, and a lot more broad than what you learn in school and what you probably don't learn in school. Um, so engage with the community and you might be able to get that support that you are looking for and live a healthy, uh, consensual uh, and engaging sexual relationship. But that's all from us today, unfortunately. We could talk about this for another hour or so, I think. Um, but uh, we can't. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much to my guests, Ellie and Adam. And please do check out the two previous uh, episodes uh, that highlight the issues that uh, Ellie mentioned, the disabled women and uh, disability and, and queerness one um, that I was in as well very good videos but thank you so much for for listening to us do uh get in, in contact with us if you would so like um and we look forward to catching up with you at our next episode